Half a day students, I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. You all have been through a year of big changes. We've had to adapt and make big changes to keep our families and our islands safe. But with change comes opportunity and a chance to try new things like PBS University. While Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenori and I will continue to do our part to keep our islands safe, you students have a part to play as well. Your part is to keep learning and to keep up with your lessons. That's why I am happy to see you here ready to learn with PBS University. PBS University is a way to bring a continuous educational curriculum to you while you stay safe at home during this time. To help you keep up with your studies, we asked our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education to put together this episode. Thank you for doing your part and have a great lesson. Humanities Guan, an independent nonprofit organization affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities, is dedicated to promoting public humanities programming for the people of Guam and providing foundational support and educational resources for our island community. For more information about Humanities Guan, visit www.humaniesguan.org. The following webinar series is part of a project presented by Humanities Guan entitled Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Pataguan. This project explores tomorrow's stories, experiences, and perspectives on civic engagement in relation to voting rights, democracy, political status, and tomorrow's self-determination. Unincorporated consisted of the five-part webinar series that took place from January through May 2021 and covered topics on the origins of tomorrow's self-determination, the work of the Commission on Decolonization, the relationship between art and decolonization, and the role of the U.S. legal system as it relates to Guam's political status. The project culminated with the launch of an online and printed magazine distributed throughout the community, which consists of essays, creative reflections, and artwork exploring issues around Guam's political status and decolonization colonization through the perspectives and historical and political experiences of the Chamorro people of Guahan. All right, half a day. Buenas. On behalf of Humanities Guahan, welcome. Uh, today's webinar, Art and Sovereignty, Artist Responses to Democracy and Chamorro Self-Determination, is uh, the third webinar in the Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Pataguahan series, which is part of a U.S. initiative funded by the Mellon Foundation called Why It Matters. And uh, this explores civic and electoral participation. Of course, for us here, electoral participation and even voting means something very different. So when we ask why it matters here in Guam, the conversation cannot be had without acknowledging and thinking about Guam's political status, our island's quest for tomorrow's self-determination and decolonization. And art has always been an expression and a reflection of the issues, histories, and experiences of the community in which it was produced. And artists have always been at the forefront of showing us ways of perceiving the world. What better way to think about what matters here in Guam than to hear it from our artists? So we're very honored to welcome today's artists, including Dr. Melissa Taitsuno, who will be facilitating today's webinar and introducing each of the panelists as they present. So let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Taitsuno. She hails from the village of Jigo, Guam, and she is a Tan Gesh apprentice carver under the tutelage of Palu master traditional navigator, Larry Raikatul, sailing under the Weryang ma mast. Uh, Dr. Taitsuno is an artist wood carver and assess, uh, assistant professor at the University of Guam. She received her doctorate's degree from UCLA in archival studies, and her research interests broadly include archives, Micronesian cultural memory, preservation, information-seeking behavior, and digital archives. Uh, and as I learned from Chamorro language advocate, Selena uh, Onodera Salas, the last webinar facilitator, Good morning, good day to everyone. Uh, we are incredibly honored 
that you're sharing um, part of your day with us to listen to our amazing panelists, Mr. Rick R. Castro, uh, Ms. Cara Flores, and Ms. Carrie Ann Ifit Naputi Borja, uh, all accomplished Chamorro artists uh, who are here today to share their ideas of how our colonial realities, decolonization, and Chamorro self determination in the broadest sense. Uh, have influenced their respective bodies of work. So, uh, without further ado, allow me the honor of introducing our first artist, Mr. Rick R. Castro. Uh, Mr. Castro is a native Chamorro raised on the family beach in the north of the island of Guam, uh, currently a full professor uh, of art at the University of Guam. He's primarily known for his paintings, uh, but also does printmaking. Uh, Castro studied at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, uh, he utilizes his personal experiences and memories of growing up in an island locale to produce expressionistic paintings uh, that strip away the narrative and allow uh, the work to retain a level of ambiguity, uh, unified with energy and movement to keep its audience uh, curious but engaged in spiritual contemplation. Uh, when Castro works uh, in his more personal, abstract, expressionist mode, rather than an idyllic paradise uh, filled with white sand beaches, clear waters, and brightly colored flowers, uh, you'll catch a glimpse of a rougher, more basic, elemental, and primal nature. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum of, the subject, of subject matter, Castro is currently in the process of completing his series entitled Junglescapes of Guam, a body of loose impressionist styled landscape paintings that provide a visual study of the deeper wild environment of Guam. Senor Castro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Titano. Um, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here and to be selected to be part of this group. Um, my, my first concern was in, in agreeing to do this was currently at the time my, my work is, is somewhat nostalgic in terms of landscape. So I wasn't sure how I could contribute to the, to the dialogue. But uh, when, I taught, when I thought about it, that the land issue um, was definitely an angle I could share as far as, um, you know, where my work has started and where it is now. Um, I guess we could begin with these two um, early works of, um, these were two pieces I did back in um, 1990, 1991, when I decided to return to art school. And uh, prior to that, I was a graphic artist. I, I graduated from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and ended my career as a creative director for the Micronesia Mall and decided that um, I wasn't sure if, if I wanted to continue being a commercial artist because of the lack of freedom in terms of the imagery that um, I wanted to convey. I was very lucky enough to get a scholarship to go back to art school. Uh, the school I ended up going to was like one of the oldest classical schools in the U.S. called the Pennsylvania Academy. So if I wanted to learn how to paint and do fine art versus commercial art, which is what I was trained to do prior to that, um, I figured this would be a school that I can learn how to brush up my skills and techniques and really kind of do the work that was more personal to me in terms of fine art and, and not doing it for, for any commercial use or being told how to do it or what to do. So initially when I got there, I, I was like, you know, the terror of looking at a blank canvas and wondering, okay, what can I do that is going to make me stand out? And the first thing uh, all of us new students going in was we wanted to stand out. We wanted to do something very conceptual that uh, had some strength to it. And, um, you know, I had my classmates telling me, hey, you know, you're from an exotic island. You know, you're so lucky um, you, you can draw from your, your culture to, to as, as a source resource for material. And, um, and then when I thought about that, I, you know, it sort of uh, opened my eyes, um, so to speak, in terms of, of what I could tap into. And um, one of the, the things, the most obvious things that I was able to, to pull from was my upbringing uh, on Guam, uh, being raised near the ocean, uh, coming from a family of, of fishermen, taladeros, and pescadots in my family. Um, so I, I started to think of symbols that I could utilize in my work. And one of the first things I could think of uh, that related to the ocean was the fish. 
And so the fish became a very symbolic part of my visual vocabulary in terms of what I wanted to use in my work. Um, this first piece on the left called A Tulai Conversation was a self-portrait, somewhat humorous, um, but shocking in a way. <laughs> it, it was sort of a revelation in terms of what I mentioned earlier about opening my eyes to the uh, different resources that I could draw from in terms of my culture. So the fish being a fisherman myself, uh, skin diving, and I had a couple of uh, my brother, my father, and my two brothers were all scuba divers at the time. So we were all fishermen and it was something we did every Sunday and even during weekdays at night when we go spear fishing. So the fish became part of that. But I wanted to go one step further and uh, I was a really brash young artist at the time. And I was thinking, um, you know, our, the family property being landlocked on a military installation was, was somewhat frustrating for, for me as, as a teen and for my family. So I wanted to do a, a work of art that would actually bring light to that. And so what you see on the right is a, my very first woodblock print. I think I ended up doing um, maybe 15 of those prints. And it was really done with symbols of, of the experience of being a landowner on Anderson. So in this one, you could see, again, it's a self-portrait. I did have more, more hair then. And uh, I'm holding the fish and you could see a padlock there uh, representing the landlock aspect of the property. Uh, the blue eyes representing the, the federal government. And what you see that looks somewhat like cactus in the background is actually staghorn coral which uh, a lot of people, when they visit our property up there and they go into the water, they see the staghorn coral and they're so amazed how preserved it is. And they go into other beaches and it's very hard to find. So I was very proud of that. So I had to put that in there. And then, so that particular uh, print was, would probably be the most political piece I've ever done, even, even up to now. Uh, and the title of it is called Janapsen One, basically meaning that at some point, uh, we may win that battle of access with the federal government. So it was sort of a print representing hope more than anything. So, so after my initial undergrad study with art, I sort of wanted to depart from conceptual art of the narrative where you can clearly see what it's about and sort of make it out in terms of um, representational uh, things that people recognize and take it to the next level, so to speak. So, uh, at the time, I was, I was visiting uh, New York and traveling a lot. And these two pieces that you see here were done in my first year of study in the graduate program after um, finishing my undergrad uh, work. And it, it sort of culminated from my exposure to visiting Metropolitan Museum of Art and my travels to Europe, where I won a travel award upon graduation to look at more work. Uh, across, um, you know, different European countries. And I got exposed to abstract art, fell in love with it. And so when I went up to New York one day, I, I, I stood in front of a Jackson Pollock painting that was something I wasn't really into in terms of non-objective art. I was always doing narrative art. So this was the first time I had my full exposure to an original. It was a huge, it must have been 14 feet wide. Um, one of Jackson Pollock's biggest and most important pieces at the Metropolitan. And uh, I looked at it and I felt very touched emotionally and spiritually with this piece. And I've never had a work of art do that to me. So I wanted to explore that further. So when I got back into the studio, I started to work on a series of abstractions. But at the same time, I still wanted to utilize symbols um, in my work. So uh, with this new work and direction I was going in, I started to think of things that were important to the island. And one of the things I adopted as part of that visual vocabulary was the petroglyph in Gatos Cave. So I took that and embedded it into my paintings. And what you see here, the, the painting on the right is called Kinship. And it's basically close to eight feet, five by eight feet, huge oil on canvas. The piece on the left is called uh, Tangle of Life. And basically a play on the word tangle. A lot of people would say my work looked like a tangled of vines and jungle, which they were right. That's really where it was derived from. But at the same time, uh, I did a lot of other works that sort of took on a jungle slash 
city-like thing or touch to it. So when I returned back uh, after my graduate study, I went to, uh, I wanted to depart from even symbols and get more into non-objective, more spiritual aspect of my work. And uh, I was lucky to be invited to Louis Vuitton to have a solo show. But the catch was they wanted me to do my abstracts. They loved my abstract uh, series utilizing the petroglyph and they wanted something similar to that. But I really wanted to do something new. And that was the culmination of this new series that I went into. It's still really derived from the land, the ocean, the waves, the sand, fish. But I really didn't want to uh, make it too obvious. I wanted to sort of tap into the emotional aspect of art and choose an aesthetic where people can actually approach it and feel something emotionally as well as spiritually. So that was my goal in doing this series of abstracts. And I still do it uh, today. I still continue this series, but the audience is somewhat limited. So there's not too many people that uh, appreciate this more personal, spiritual um, direction that I was going in, but it didn't prevent me from doing it for myself. Um, but at the same time, I started doing landscapes. I started doing landscapes for my students and was uh, one day I accumulated so many of them. Uh, my pari at the time, Joe Babalta, rest his soul, uh, made a suggestion that I should do, I should put all these landscapes together and, and as a collection of Guam and present it as a book. And so that planted the seeds of something that is now taken over 16 years to, to do, and I'm still doing it. And I figured, okay, if I'm going to do these landscapes, it would be returning to the narrative, which is fine with me, but I still wanted it to, to have the feel of my abstractions. So I chose this. This was the very first Jungle Scapes painting I ever did. And one of the reasons why I chose it was the, the Federico palm, as we all know, is an endangered plant endemic to the island. And there's only, it was almost wiped out by a bug some type of aphid that was just wiping out the population in Federico's. And, and there's a history of this being used in our culture. And it's such a primitive plant that I, I wanted to pay homage to it before we lost it. So that uh, became the catalyst for the Jungle Scape series. And from there, I, I figured if I'm gonna do Jungle Scapes, then I wanted it to be in areas that people couldn't reach or that were hard to get to. And, and this was to bring awareness that we have all these, these secret pockets of land that are there right in front of our eyes. It's just, we just have to look for it. Prior to that, a lot of the land, including our family property, uh, denied access to the average uh, citizen. So I figured, you know, maybe this could be a way for me to kind of give exposure and awareness to the precious little land that we do have uh, left on Guam, even if it's hidden or landlocked on military installations. So that was my goal in beginning the series. So to the left, you have Lost Pond, and to the right is Fonte River, which is a little further from the Fonte Dam. Um, I had a habit of going to these sites that were easily accessible by the average hiker, but I wanted to go deeper, deeper into the jungle and really, with my camera, record these other areas that I may be able to give exposure to. And the biggest compliment I got was people were looking at these and say, hey, where is this? Is this in the Amazon? I said, no, I said, this is Guam. And you know, we're, we're, it's here and you could visit it yourself if you, if you try. But I got a little bit of satisfaction knowing that you know, my fellow Chamorros were seeing these, these paintings of mine and thinking it was somewhere more exotic than the island. And I'm like, no, this is here, this is home. So these are the, and these aren't small paintings. These are like uh, three by four feet, four by five feet uh, panels on Masonite. So I was also experimenting on surface. This next slide is sort of embedded in the series. I, I didn't want to lose track of my original intent of doing my abstract expressionist work. So I would dabble back into abstraction. These are a couple of pieces that really sort of revisit that. On the left, you see the coconut nizuk, if you look closely, done more in sort of an impressionist style. I, I love Monet's lily pond paintings, and it, it just sort of worked my, its way into my work as well as Jackson Pollock. The, the painting to the right is called Hula Skirt Coconut, where the dead leaves would fall, but there was still a lot of color that I wanted to communicate in it to bring my aesthetic to my work. And again, just a, a, 
simple uh, landscape to bring awareness uh, through my art to remind people of the beauty of our island, whether it's right at your feet or a panorama of, of some distant uh, landmark like Seti Bay. And here we have the Nipa Palm. This is a huge painting, seven and a half feet by five feet. And it's basically um, a study of the Nipa Palm. When I was doing this painting, I did a little research on it and I found out that the ancient Chamorros uh, used this to, to do thatching because of its waterproof properties. And so I thought that was, you know, the, these palm stalks that came out of the, the embankments of Seti Bay River were just almost primitive-like. It was really amazing to see that these stalks that looked like someone stuck a coconut leaf into the water uh, were as thick as tree trunks. And so I wanted to convey that. And I said, I can't do a small painting of this. It has to be big. So I started to enlarge my paintings, and this was one of the results of that. Mr. Castro, um, sure. I, I wanted just to, um, so you've talked about some really fascinating concepts, and some of them in just the last couple slides that you've articulated was a kind of opening of your eyes. You said you talked about entanglements um, and then um, moving from, from sty stylistically moving from more naturalism to more abstract and kind of in between those, because in your words, you said you wanted to evoke emotion and connect. So um, in terms of just uh, of what you've said, is there, a, and you've also mentioned that, you know, you wanted to really highlight special places, particular plants, giving homage to those subjects that you're painting. When you're doing that and you decide, uh, you know, you want to convey a particular emotion or sentiment, is mm -hmm. it something that happens serendipitously or is it something that you plan as an artist? Like, here's an emotion I want to convey and here's a you know, particular subject that I'm thinking about. What is your process in that way, just in terms of connecting the land, connecting people and dealing with those kind of entanglements with the tools uh, at your disposal, uh, you know, whether it's stylistically or uh, using color? or uh, different types of paint or uh, drawing? Basically, no. When I, when I go down there, for instance, on a jaunt down to Seti Bay, I was dropped there by um, a Champ, Champ Kanata, and he dropped me by boat because I, I just wanted to get there. I could have hiked there, but I just wanted to, to just be dropped there. He left me there for like five, six hours, and, and it just went by so quickly. But when I entered the jungle, I didn't have any preconceived idea of any particular plant that I wanted to, to paint or not. And, and it just it's almost by accident that a lot of these paintings that I end up doing uh, end up having some particular meaning to it as far as the importance of it. In this case, the Nipah palm or a connection to to any kind of political theme or just. And that's what I loved about about it is is I didn't have to do that. It just would happen. And the color, of course, is just from years of training and exposure to other masters and going into museums and stuff. And, and that's one of the things that, that when you see my paintings, they, they may be slightly exaggerated in terms of color uh, that I'm sharing with my audience. And, and part of the reason for that is, is the understanding that being isolated here as a native Chamorro, um, there's not a lot of us that get a chance to travel abroad and, and take a look at uh, the world in more of a global sense. So all my experiences of, of going to museums and stuff, I wanted to convey in the work and bring it back to the island and share it with them. Even though it, it is a westernized way of learning, I, I am bringing back a traditional European standard in terms of how I paint. But I figured uh, if I can take that and convey it in a way where I could do works that people understand, and I would be fulfilling my obligation as an artist in terms of as a Chamorro and how to contribute to the culture and share it with, um, with people that never have a chance to leave this island. And that's where I see the benefit of my background uh, in terms of, of what I want to convey. And right here you see uh, Tarzan Falls. It, it, it's another place that you have to hike to. Not a very hard place to get to, but, you know, someone like the Manumco that see this and they, they it, I, you know, it was so beautiful to have a few Manumco come up to me and tap me on the shoulder and said, and thank me for doing these paintings. And I'm like, why are you thanking me? And, and well, one person said to me, because you brought back memories. So um, this this painting is, is one of those little places that um, if it could spark any kind of nostalgic 
uh, with the older generation, our elders, then it really brings satisfaction to me. All right, so I'm going to rush through these. These the, you got one in the upper left is Seti Bay, looking back. I love this shot. I painted it like four or five times. These webinars can be accessed on Humanities Guahan's Facebook page. To view the online magazine associated with Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Paraguahan, visit humanitiesguahan.org backslash unincorporated. Half a day students, I'm Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. For more than a year now, you all have continued to wash your hands and watch your distance from others, and you've done a really great job wearing your masks. We know your parents and guardians have helped you to make these changes to keep yourself and your community safe. As Governor Leon Guerrero said, we are happy you are here. We want you to continue to learn and sharpen your skills with the help of PBS University. This program is the result of a collaborative effort. We couldn't do it alone. I'd like to thank the teachers and support staff of the Guam Department of Education and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to our students. I'd also like to thank you students for participating at home. To your parents, I'd like to thank you for taking an active role in your child's education. We are all eager to return to a time when all of us can share and study together in person. Until then, we hope you learned something new from this PBS University instruction.